You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about exciting, creative, and innovative ways of living. Produced in Santa Barbara, California, Sustainable World focuses on positive solutions to environmental challenges, solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned to Sustainable World Radio. I'm Jill Cloutier. And my guest this morning is Toby Hemingway, author of the permaculture book, Gaia's Garden, A Guide to Home-Scale Permaculture. Good morning, Toby. Good morning, Jill. And Toby, I'd like to start with um, a bit of your background. You worked for many years as a researcher in genetics and immunology, first in academic laboratories and then at at a major medical biotech company. And about the same time that you were growing dissatisfied with biotechnology, you discovered permaculture. And I'd love to know, what was it about permaculture that made you change your life in such a radical way? Sure. Well, um, I've always loved nature ever since I was a little kid. But when when it came time to find a job, there was just a lot more work in molecular biology and genetics than there was in, say, field naturalism. And I found both fields equally fascinating, kind of unraveling nature's secrets you know, on, a, on a deep level with genetics. But uh, as the biotech industry kind of developed, well, essentially I kind of woke up one day and said, wait a minute, this fun little R&D company I used to work for has turned into a giant drug company, and that's not what I intended for my life. And my wife was in a similar position, and we were uh, planning on moving to the country and kind of slowing down a bit, and I was playing hooky from my biotech job in the Seattle Public Library and discovered Bill Mollison's new book, Permaculture, a Designer's Manual, which is the Bible of permaculture. And I picked it off the shelf and leafed through it and said, wow, this is gardening and renewable energy and even social justice systems and natural building and ecology, and it's all put together in a package that that makes sense. And I I, just, I basically never looked back at that point. It just said, this is, this is for me, this is what I want to do. And uh, we moved to the country, and I practiced rural permaculture for about a decade at that point. And so you, you were living in the country, and it sounds like you really embraced permaculture. And at that time, did you just kind of do it at home and then start teaching, or how did you become um, a permaculture teacher? Well, I took a number of courses and workshops and and kind of studied under a couple of people who were really prominent and uh, just very knowledgeable folks in permaculture and worked with them and learned a lot and made a ton of mistakes and practiced on my own on our, our rural site. And uh, gradually, see, I, I, my, part of my science job was, uh, was explaining science to people who didn't know a lot about science, and I found that I was fairly good at it and uh, decided that I could do the same with permaculture, just learned a lot about it, and then made it an effort to, to uh, teach at a couple of courses and try and, you know, and do workshops and that sort of thing. And gradually it took off and got successful. But I had a, a lot of help from other people who really mentored me through it. What you said about explaining scientific concepts to people in an easy-to-understand way, I love your book, Gaia's Garden, A Guide to Homescale Permaculture, and the second edition I have sitting right here, because to me it explains permaculture in a way that I think anyone would understand. And I would love to hear, kind of off the cuff, how do you describe permaculture to people when they ask you, what is what are you talking about here with permaculture? Well, if, if I just have like a two-word sound bite, I, I think of it as applied ecology. But if I have a little bit more time than that, my, my favorite definition is that if you think of things like organic gardening and renewable energy and natural and green building and, and things like that as tools for sustainability, then permaculture is the toolbox that helps you organize those tools and figure out how to use them. It's, it's really a, a design approach for, for making decisions. And we have all these tools for doing all kinds of things and all these ways of, of designing and all these methodologies. And which ones do you use? And permaculture really gives you a lot of information about, about how to make those decisions, how to decide what to do. And that's, that's what I love about it is that there's no kind of real belief system involved. You just apply it and it works 
or it doesn't, and then and, and you, you have the answers to a lot of your questions. And I loved what you said in the book about mistakes just show you're trying to, to do things better. Yeah, that's, that's what I love. One of the things I love about both permaculture and science is that unless you make an utterly disastrous mistake, and hopefully we don't make too many of those in our lives, usually mistakes can be very educational. And I, I learn a lot from my mistakes. I, I kind of prefer to learn from other people's mistakes, but, but I learn a lot from, from my own. And, and they are a sign that you're trying something new. If you're not making mistakes, then... You know, you're not really out on the edge. And, you know, I did love in your book your definition because it really made it clear to me on how to describe permaculture. It's not organic gardening, and it's not uh, alternative energy, and it's not all of these things. Those are the tools. In your definition, permaculture is the link between all of these different tools. Right, right. It shows how to connect all of those things together into a, a coherent whole, into a, into kind of a living organism. You know, imagine living in a landscape that feels like like you're living with a real live being. That's, that's what permaculture helps you create. It sounds like you and your wife um, spent 10 years creating a rural permaculture site in southern Oregon. And then, Toby, it sounds like you kind of did the reverse of what a lot of people do. Instead of moving from the city and escaping the city, you actually went back into Portland, into the city. Can you tell our listeners what prompted that move? Well, some of it was just purely practical in that I was traveling a lot for work and I was hardly ever home and there wasn't really much local work in southern Oregon where we were living. So a little bit of it was practical, but, but part of it was that we really went from feeling kind of secluded in our rural place to feeling isolated. It just was very hard to, to get people to drive the miles down our gravel road to come visit us and it was a 20-minute drive to, uh, to go anywhere and I became really aware that contemporary rural life in America, not the old farming rural life, but contemporary rural life in America is actually far more resource intensive than, than urban living is now, that we were burning way more gas and everybody had huge yards and using all kinds of resources and quarter mile driveways and these sorts of things. And, and I, I just, I, it, my eyes opened to the fact that American rural life as it is now is essentially just suburbanites with even bigger yards. And that, uh, that really bothered me to be consuming so many resources just to support my rural lifestyle. So, and also, we just needed to be where the people were, really. I, I felt that I had, you know, I had some things I wanted to say. I wanted to be around like-minded people, and so we chose Portland to move back to. And, and sure enough, my resource use has declined incredibly since I've come back into the city because I don't really need to drive a car, and I don't have a quarter-mile driveway. And... Uh, you know, everything's within walking distance. I just visited a friend that lives about maybe 25 minutes out of town. And I remembered when I lived in Hawaii, driving 30 minutes to get to a small town. And one day I was just like, this doesn't make sense when I'm trying to live more of an ecological lifestyle. If you do have to continue to come into town for work. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. I mean, if, if you're a self-reliant farmer or rancher or something like that, then rural life makes a lot of sense. But there are really only 6% of people who live in rural areas live that way. The other 94% of them commute to a job just like everybody else, but their commute is even longer. So that, that just began to disturb me. In your book, you write about true backyard ecosystems. And can you tell us what you mean by that term? And is that what you're doing in Portland? That's certainly what we're trying to create here. And I'm working on a number of different sites trying to do that. And the, you know, in, a, in a conventional landscape, even, even one that's organic and, and that sort of thing, Usually there's a garden off in one corner, and then there might be some flowers somewhere else, and there might be a couple of fruit trees in a, you know, in a nice orderly row, and everything's all separated like that. And in an ecological landscape, the pieces are all connected so that instead of an individual tree, you have what we call a guild of trees, where the, the tree is supported by a group of other plants that, that help bring in pollinators and help fertilize it and that sort of thing. And the vegetables are not off abandoned in a little corner where the zucchini get as big as baseball bats because no one's out there to see them. They're, they're right integrated right by the front doorstep so that you, you notice them all the time. They're easy to take care of. You can, your weeding becomes you know, just something that you do when you have a cup of coffee in your hand and you're admiring your garden rather than kind of making the trudge out to the garden. So all the pieces are, are put together that instead of having a plant for just one purpose, like shade, a plant will, yes, it'll have shade, but it'll produce habitat and it'll produce fruit and it's harvesting rainwater and it's 
breaking up the soil and it's adding leaf litter to the soil. It's, it's behaving the way a forest does. And we can actually design landscapes that are like that now. We've learned from indigenous cultures and from ecology and just from trial and error how to create these vibrant living landscapes that, that bring in birds and beneficial insects and people have fun in them and they produce food and other products for our use. And, you know, Toby, in your book, you talk about how conventional gardens and lawns mimic immature ecosystems. And it sounds like what you're saying is what we we could be doing instead is mimicking forests and more advanced um, ecosystems. Can you tell me about how our lawn does provide the perfect conditions for weeds to grow? (laughs) (laughs) Right, exactly. Well, in in a lawn wants, as, as long as you're in a place that has adequate rainfall, I mean, if anywhere where there's more than about 20 inches of rainfall a year, the natural state of the landscape is forest, that the trees will eventually move in wherever there's more than about 20 or 25 inches of rainfall a year. And in order for us to keep our yards at the state of grasses, that's a really early phase in the development of a landscape. And for us to hold things back at that early stage We've got to use all kinds of fertilizers and all kinds of equipment like lawnmowers and and that sort of thing. And there's this constant bombardment by nature bringing in seeds of other plants that want to help move that lawn toward a forest. And that that succession goes from grasses to kind of weedy, herbaceous things to shrubs to trees. And we have to apply a huge amount of energy to hold our yards back at that early phase of, of grasses. So nature's just trying as hard as she can to move it towards forest, and, and part of that is to bring in all kinds of things that we call weeds. Wow, so those weeds are actually, they're really trying to do their job, and then out we go again to, to pull them up. <laughs> exactly. They're trying to build the soil fertility and break up heavy clay soils and bring in pollinators and all these things, and you know, we just keep on setting it back and setting it back, and nature is got a lot more patience than we have. So would you say, Toby, then, if you're, if you're a lazy um, lawn care, <laughs> care person, if you just let your lawn go, would the weeds would take over, and then what would happen next? What would happen after that, and I've seen it in, in my own places, is that eventually a, a series of things that are much more like wildflowers move in, and then small shrubs begin to move in, and eventually it will turn into trees. And since that's the process that's going to happen naturally, why not just plant the shrubs and trees right away? Because there's so many wonderful shrubs that supply all kinds of great products for us, and the same with trees. And they also provide all kinds of habitat for beneficial insects and birds, and they keep the ground shaded so that we're not sweltering in the heat and all kinds of great things like that. Nature's going to take you there anyway. Uh, so why don't you just kind of give up the fight to someone who is older and wiser and stronger than you and, uh, and just let your yard become a lovely little woodland garden. And so what you're doing almost is going with the flow of the natural energy of the land, but also you can pick and choose what trees and shrubs you want around your house. Yeah, yeah. I'm not talking about abandoning your yard to become some, you know, some weedy wild land or <laughs> something like that. You, you bring in your consciousness to guide this process and tweak it so that it goes in directions that you want it to. But nature really gets the ball rolling, and and you just help her along because she'll bring in all those beneficial insects and and beautiful birds and butterflies and things like that. You just create the conditions for that stuff to happen, and nature says, oh, boy, and jumps right in there and makes it all go, and you have so much less work to do at that point. Because I, I don't have a lawn at this point, but my neighbors do, and he is exhausted every weekend. Yeah, I have the same thing. A a number of my neighbors here have done sheet mulches in their yard and plant all kinds of shrubs and trees and and beautiful herbaceous flower plants and things like that. But I do have one neighbor who is out there twice a week mowing and edging and fertilizing, and he doesn't look like he's having any fun. But, you know, it's it's just a different philosophy. I mean, I I, I think it's if he's going to do that, he certainly has a right to, but, and he's a great guy. I like him too, but, uh, you know, I just, I see the resource use and the watering and the fertilizer and the, the chem lawn truck and all of that that comes by and just think, boy, there's, there's a simpler way to have a really beautiful yard. And so, Toby, tell our listeners now, so we're, we're talking a bit about conventional yards. They do um, use a lot of resources and our energy as well. 
What are some of the major differences, and you kind of touched on them a bit in our previous conversation, between conventional gardens and a backyard ecosystem? Right. Well, a, a backyard ecosystem could certainly include a little patch of grass. I mean, we, we like grass, and so having a little bit there would be fine, although there are plenty of other plants that, that could do the job of grass. But it starts with having the things that you use the most often or that need your care the most often right by your doorstep. You know, that you're, you, and this is the way people have done it traditionally for, well, for thousands of years, is their kitchen garden goes right outside their back door or their kitchen door so that they can just step right outside and take care of all that without having to, to do a long trudge out to the vegetable beds. You just know right where your, your herbs and your salad greens are. They're, they're right there outside your door. And then you can bring in things like, like fruit trees, which will have beautiful flowers in the spring to attract beneficial insects. And underneath those, you can plant various things that will fertilize the soil or bring in beneficial insects and, and bring in helpful other sorts of helpful wildlife like that. You can, putting down mulch is a huge step to take because most of our soils are in such bad shape and it's really the life of the soil that creates the basis for this whole living ecosystem. That if mulch decomposes into beautiful soil and that's how you really jumpstart this whole decomposer process. It's getting the compost cycles in your yard going will bring all of this life in, bring all of this fertility, start all these nutrient flows going underground, and your plants will just love that, and, uh, and you'll have much less work to do if you just intervene strategically by doing things like mulching and choosing the right plants. And in mulching, are you, just, are you mimicking the leaf litter in a forest? Exactly. That's, that's just what it does. You know, nature does not pull out big tillers and tractors to build up fertility. She just creates this gentle rain of leaf litter on the ground, and that builds up, and there are all these decomposing organisms, the earthworms and little beetles and, and fungi and bacteria in the soil who are there to turn all that into great fertility for your plants. And so by putting mulches on the ground, and it hardly matters what it is, I mean, anything organic, anything that will, will decompose, so it can be you know, arborist tree trimmings or straw or anything like that, you... you jumpstart these processes of decomposition and get all this fertility going in the soil. But that's, that's how nature builds soil, and, and all the organisms in the soil know exactly what to do when you provide them that mulch. That, and so you're kind of mimicking the natural, um, not patterns, but natural um, actions that would be happening on your land if you weren't there. Right, exactly. That's, that's one of the beautiful things about this, is these processes are going to go on whether you're there or not. And so you just, you just start those processes going, and nature comes in and says, oh, I know what to do with all of this, and, and just makes it go. And you can, you know, one of the, the little lines that we use in permaculture is that you plant two fruit trees about 10 feet apart, and you do all your mulching and, and all the original things that you need to get the garden going, and then by the time the fruit trees are big enough, you just sling your hammock between them, and the designer becomes the recliner at that point. I love that. I like that. <laughs> so, so you're really going to build soil fertility and health, and mulching sounds like a great way. What about water in a garden, especially in a place with San, uh, like Santa Barbara where we get about 18 inches of rain? How could you water your garden um, in a sustainable way? Right. Well, we already, every yard has an enormous water harvesting device right there ready to go, and it's called your roof. Just e even in a place that only gets 18 inches of rainfall a year or even less, uh, a house roof is enough to harvest pretty much all the rainwater that you need to take care of your water needs there. And so if you have tanks or cisterns or even just a way of delivering that rainwater right into the soil, you know, rather than going down the downspout and down into the city storm drain system, if you get it into the soil and the soil is properly mulched, the water won't evaporate, it'll stay right there, and it, you can at least extend the season that you don't need to water. Now, I know that Santa Barbara has a very long, dry season, and you probably still need to do some watering, but you can really reduce the amount that you have to do just by catching the rainwater that naturally falls on your roof and by mulching and a few other techniques like that to make sure that the water stays in the soil and 
Planting lots of things to create shade is another way to do that. Keep those soil temperatures down so that the precious water won't evaporate as soon as it hits the ground. You know what's really um, interesting to me in Santa Barbara is that the, there's a phenomenon here is the raking the soil. Um, <laughs> I, it's very it's interesting. I walk down some of the city streets and you just see these raked where you actually see the rake marks in the soil, which to me seems doesn't make any sense in, in, in a Mediterranean climate like this. It would certainly increase evaporation for sure. It would dry the soil out even faster and not make it possible for, for plants to get started there and and plants themselves will help hold the water in the soil. So soil health is very important, Toby. Water is important. Um, do you have any other tips for water, uh, how water works in the uh, backyard ecosystem? Yeah, I, and I, I think it still still continues with soil because a topsoil that, that has, is rich in organic matter that's been, been properly mulched or um, has, has good, rich organic content in it is capable of holding, well, I think the, the numbers are that a foot of good topsoil will hold three to four inches of water in it. And so that water is already in the ground where you want it, and it's not going to evaporate like it would if, say, it's in an open pond or something like that. So by building up the organic matter in your soil, your soil will store the water right there. It won't evaporate very quickly, and that's the place to, to put it. One of the other little sayings we use in permaculture is that the cheapest place to store water is in the soil, that by building up your soil and getting the water right into it, that, that delivers it right to the plants and it holds it there so that it won't evaporate. You can think of a, a foot of good topsoil in your yard as a three or four inch deep lake back there, but it's not going to evaporate because it's, it's stored in the ground. It's not getting hit by, by the sunlight like that. So building up the soil is really important. And you can also make contours in the soil to help them hold water. I, I know a, a woman who had a little tiny lawn, and she shaped it in the, in the contour of a, of a dish, just the, the center of it, a little circle about 15 feet in diameter. The center of it was three or four inches deeper, uh, lower down than the edges, so that whenever it rained, water would run right to the center of it and stay there and not run off. So you can contour your soil, just little tiny divots like that that will help direct the rainwater where you want it and hold it there. So building topsoil then, what, what's another way of, build, say that you move into a house in the backyard, it's just a lawn there. How could you, um, the quickest way to build topsoil? Right. Well, the great thing about being in, in any urban or suburban area is that there are tree trimming services all around or the power company is constantly chipping up things and they have to take those chips to the dump. So when I hear the chipper in my neighborhood, I'll just go talk to the talk to the crew, and they're usually delighted to drop off 10 yards of nice fresh wood chips. And even even if it's eucalyptus, they will decompose really quickly. And I just spread it around a foot deep in my yard, um, particularly if I'm trying to get rid of the lawn or old areas that have you know those lovely bark chips or things that really uh, don't don't add a lot of fertility to the soil and spread these, these, these deep wood chips that are fresh with, with a lot of leaves ground up in them, spread them out on the soil in a nice deep layer, and those will just bring in all kinds of worms and, and fun, great beneficial fungi <coughs> Excuse me, that will help decompose them. And that really jump-starts this whole process of soil formation. So that's one of the critical things, is to just bring in organic matter in almost any form that you can find it, whether... Whatever is, whatever is the cheapest, fastest, easiest way to get in your neighborhood, as long as it doesn't have a lot of weed seeds in it. And nature will just break it down and turn it into marvelous topsoil. So by starting by mulching, you'll get things really going. You can also do cover crops. You can plant things like beans and peas and fava beans, those sorts of things, and, and get their deep roots down in the soil, adding nitrogen and other kinds of fertility to the soil. So there are, there are several strategies like that that you can use. Toby, say that you're, you're um, so you've mulched, you've been building up your soil. How would you decide what plants to put into your um, backyard ecosystem? Right. Well, I would start with, with the plants that are native to your area, figure out which ones of those that will, will do the jobs that you want done, um, you know, whether you want beneficial insects brought in or whether you want food plants. Just starting with, 
with plants that, that are already native to your area because those will be the least maintenance. But to be perfectly honest, most Americans certainly don't live off of native plants. You know, I, I didn't have um, camas cakes for breakfast this morning or anything like that. I had other things. And so at that point, you look at plants that grow in areas like yours. Like in California, you know, you're in a Mediterranean climate, so what are some other Mediterranean climates? There's, of course, the Mediterranean. There's parts of South Africa. There's Chile, places like that. Those are plants that are already adapted to your habitat, and they will love growing where you are. So figure out the ones that are, again, most useful to you and bring those in. It's really about what are you going to use, what are you going to enjoy, what are you going to take care of, and what's needed in your area. Because if you just plant a bunch of things because you think they should be there or someone told you you, know, you should have species X, if it doesn't mean anything to you, if you're not going to care for it and, and integrate it into your life, then it's not going to do well. So get things that, that mean a lot to you or that you're going to use. Get your favorite plants in there because you'll take care of them. Yeah, and I like what you say about the multifunctional plants where the plant serves more than one purpose because I feel like in our yard that was there when I moved in, it's just Agapantha-ville. <laughs> it's just... There's like avenues of agapanthas. It's like, you know, you're really pretty, but I don't know what else <laughs> what right. to do with you. I know comfrey is a plant that's used often in permaculture. Could you maybe give us some of the top five multifunctional plants? And I know it would differ um, per locale as where people are located, but maybe are there any plants that you just think for sure are winners in the um, garden? Sure. Um, you've mentioned comfrey, which although some people, if, if they are inveterate rototillers, that will spread it around, so you just you don't dig near comfrey plants, but it's incredibly multifunctional in that it creates a really good mulch, beneficial insects really love it, it accumulates calcium and magnesium from deep in the soil and concentrates it in their leaves, so it's a really great composting plant. Uh, it's, it, it has medicinal uses, it, it heals wounds really quickly, um, and as I said, beneficial insects just really love it. So it's an incredibly multifunctional plant. Uh, another one would be there, there's a, a, a whole group of plants, but one, one variety of them is called Gumi, G-O-U-M-I. Um, it's an Eliagnus. It's related to Russian olive, but it's not invasive. And it has, it's, it's a nitrogen fixer, so it builds up your soil. It has beautiful silvery white flowers and really lovely kind of silver gray foliage, and it has an, an edible berry that's one of the highest in vitamin C around. Uh, so it's, again, another really multifunctional plant. Uh, another one that, that people use is bamboo, which has over 1,600 proven uses, so it's incredibly multifunctional, and it's a very fast-growing, wonderful screen that if you have a privacy or windbreak issue, it grows very quickly. And if you just don't water in the places where you don't want bamboo, for those of us who live in the arid west, it won't spread because that's one of the things that people freak out about with bamboo is it's going to take over. But you don't just don't water where you don't want it to go, or you can put in a bamboo barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are so many uses for that in just garden poles or flooring or, uh, it, it, like I say, it has 1,600 registered uses. So, yeah. so those are just a few, and with that, the palette of hundreds of thousands of plants to choose from, why not choose plants that do more than one thing? Mm -hmm. It makes total sense. So if you, you've chosen your, some of your plants, and I loved what you said in your book about just the zones and like zone one, you want your herbs and your plants you're going to be using in your garden. I think um, Larry Santoyo, who I've taken courses with, says that, what does he say? I think you had it in your book where you park your car and you should be able to pick your dinner between your right, car. Right, right. Yeah, Larry says, put your garden between your front door and your car door so that as you, as you walk home, you know, you come home from work and it may be getting dark and it's not such a nice day out and you pick your salad greens as you walk in towards your front door and by the time you're inside, now you have a nice salad all ready for you rather than getting inside and getting comfortable and realize, oh, that's right, I should go outside and get a salad. Well, it's dark. I don't want to. I'm just going to pull something out of the freezer. You know, you can have a much healthier diet if you arrange things so that plants that will be good to you like that are right on your way home. So, yeah, put your, put your salad garden in between your front door and your car door. Now, Toby, so you, you've chosen your plants and you are 
starting to plant things in your garden. I love the idea of guilds. And I know a lot of people involved in permaculture, we understand the concept of guilds, but maybe not as much as we should. So if you could describe um, to us your definition of guilds and how to create them in your own yard. Well, a, a guild is, is based on natural plant communities. You know, plants come in groupings, kind of families of plants. There are just groups of plants that, that like to grow together, that every, every area has different arrangements of native plants that know each other and that are all commonly all found together. So it's, it's based on that, this idea that we can build little communities, little assemblies of plants that all work together. But people, I think, make it too difficult. I mean, if you, if you look at the way conventional landscape designers work, any group of plants works together pretty well, usually, as long as they have similar water and fertility needs. And so there's, it's not like it's rocket science to try and figure out what groups of plants to put together. So I've, I've developed a basic list of the, the jobs that need to be done by plants in a guild. And so say we'll start with a fruit tree. Say we have a, you know, a peach tree or something like that that we want. You think of what that peach needs. It needs pollinators, so you want to bring in flowers and things like that to attract pollinators. It needs, hopefully, some kind of pest control. There are things, borers and things that like to go into, pe into uh, peach trees. So we plant more flowers to attract insects that will prey on those borers. And so now we've got a bunch of flowers around our peach tree, and that's pretty nice. We also need fertility, so we plant some nitrogen-fixing plants, either peas or beans, or there are even some perennial kinds, like that gumi that I just mentioned is a perennial nitrogen-fixing shrub that's also very pretty. And then you might want to plant some things that will create mulch to uh, build up the soil so you don't have to do it yourself. So you could bring in things like comfrey or any other plant with great big fleshy leaves like that. Uh, sea kale is, is one of my favorites. It's an edible and it has enormous leaves. It's related to broccoli and, and cabbage and those plants. So now we've got things to, to help build fertility. Sometimes plants with really good tap roots so that it'll help break up the heavy soil. And comfrey is another one of those, but you can also just use things like carrots or, uh, or Chinese white radish daikon. Uh, and so now we're breaking up the soil. So we're, we're doing these jobs that the plant needs done by mulching and bringing in pollinators and breaking up heavy soils and that sort of thing. You just think of, okay, what does this plant need and how can I choose other plants that will, will help support those needs? And that's, that's really all there is to it. It's not that complicated. And there are thousands of plant species to choose from. You're almost employing the plants that you choose to put in the guild to do the work that you might have done. That's exactly what you're doing. It, every time that you bring in some other species who's happy to build soil or add mulch or bring in beneficial insects or that sort of thing, that's one less job that you have to do yourself. And nature is just totally happy to do that. So why not let her do her job and then we can do the things we're best at or that we most enjoy doing. In the hammock. <laughs> right, exactly, yes. Toby, do guilds usually support a tree kind of in the center of the guild or not, not always? The, as long as the plants are somewhere around it. You know, if you bring in, if you have flowering plants anywhere near uh, the peach or whatever your, your central tree is, they'll, they'll find the tree for sure. If you're building fertility and those sorts of things, then yes, a comfrey or nitrogen fixers or those sorts of things should go very close to the tree. And some people worry about root competition, but I've seen lots and lots of evidence that shows that, that the beneficial effects of having things like nitrogen fixers right up close to the tree far outweigh any drawback that it might have. That the, that I've, I've done one-in-one -one comparisons where I've had planted a peach tree with a nitrogen fixer right in the same hole and then planted a peach tree 20 feet away without one, and guess which one does a lot better? There's, there's just no comparison. That's interesting. So the guild, um, the idea of guilds is not as complicated as I, I thought it was. <laughs> right. It's, it's really not. It's, it's very simple, but we kind of freak out at it because it's a new idea to us. And, but, but really, it's just choose plants that will do those jobs and put them near the, near the fruit tree or whatever the central part of the guild is, and, and nature will, will take care of it. I kind of think it, it. I think it's the word too. <laughs> it reminds right, me yeah. of like a club or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I it. should know who the members are. They might. <laughs> right, right. That's some secret society like that. Yeah. Um, and how do animals, Toby, fit into um, the ecological garden? The 
the, uh, the quintessential permaculture animal is the chicken. And, and what's really wonderful is that a lot of urban areas now are changing ordinances so that people can have chickens in cities. Lots and lots of cities are doing that. And chickens do so many great things. You know, they'll, they'll till up the soil for you, so you put them where you want the soil scratched up. You know, they can do damage if they're in the wrong place, but put where they belong, and that's the whole idea in permaculture, is you put things where they belong. So you put your chickens where you want the soil tilled up, where you want the, the wheat seeds eaten out of the soil, because chickens are way better at that than, than anybody else is. And they'll also do great insect control. The yards that I've seen that have the least insect damage, the least slug damage, all of those sorts of things are yards that have chickens in them, because they are so superb at doing insect control. So chickens are just a phenomenal animal to have in a, in a permaculture yard. Ducks are also really good. I have friends who have rabbits in their yard that mow their lawn for them. Um, That's and, great. You, know, you, can, you can either use these animals for their products or you can just let them do their jobs in the yard. But there are many different kinds of animals that fit right into a permaculture system. Just, just as animals are a really important part of nature, we also need to have them in our, in our gardens and farms as well because when they're not there, we have to do all those jobs of weed collection and, and insect control ourselves. So let, let the animals who do this naturally take care of that for you. And I know that there's um, books on creating wildlife gardens to attract wildlife to your yard. I would think that your um, idea of an ecological backyard, ecological yard or um, ecosystem would also draw wildlife. They, they really do. And sometimes you have to be careful about what kinds of wildlife you're going to be attracting, you know, whether it's raccoons or gophers or those sorts of things. But generally, the, the animals that are attracted are usually pretty beneficial. And even if you attract animals that you don't want, often you'll also attract animals that will help keep them away. I've seen that happen very often, is that, say, gophers show up, and then because you've created such great hawk and owl habitat, these birds come in and take care of the gophers for you. So, yeah, they, these, these, that's one of the other multiple functions of these ecological landscapes is that they're incredible for attracting wildlife. My, my yard in Portland had virtually no beneficial insects in it when I moved here, and after the first year of just putting in wonderful flowers and things like that, suddenly I was counting 15 to 20 different species of, of beneficial in bees and wasps and, and little critters like that that really are very helpful at pollinating and insect control. So incredible diversity just came roaring out of it within the first year. That's just so, that's very hopeful for me to hear. <laughs> it, it is, and that's one of the things I love about permaculture. You know, I, I come from an environmentalist background where, you know, I was, I was raging against the machine and all of that that, that that folks like me do. And when I discovered permaculture, I realized this is a positive approach this is a set of solutions. This isn't about fighting. This isn't about trying to stop something. This is about creating something beautiful and, and having a positive approach to all of these things. And I, just, I, I think I'm a lot healthier since I've been doing that. I certainly feel better. But just a, it, that's what I love about it is that it is so positive, and it creates these incredibly beautiful and abundant landscapes. You know, and that kind of go leads into my next question, because in your book, you write that taking care of ourselves in our own yards means that factory farms, <laughs> excuse me, and forests can shrink. Can you explain to our listeners what you mean by that? Yeah, that, that having, if, if we're not taking care of our own needs in our own yards, even if it's just growing a little bit of food or, or even something as minor as having a bamboo plant so that we can stake up our, our tomatoes with, you know, with homegrown steaks instead of buying them somewhere, that when we take care of our needs in our own yard, what that means is that somewhere else out of sight, there isn't going to have to be a little bit more corn planted for you or uh, a little bit more of some industrial farm because we, we know that when we grow our own food, we know it's being grown right. We know it's being grown the way that we want to do it. Or if we're supporting a, a local farmer or farmer's market, when we get to know them, we know that that's being done pretty ecologically in a way that we can support, whereas if we're just buying something off the shelf at the store, who knows how that stuff is made, and you know that there's some giant machine and probably a huge amount of infrastructure and soil loss and habitat loss and all of that going on out of sight somewhere. So by taking care of our own needs in our own yard, we shrink our ecological footprint 
tremendously. By, and, and somewhere out there, a little bit of land gets to go free because we've chosen to take care of ourselves, our needs in our own yards really fits in with what you were saying about, you know, instead of being that voice of doom that like fighting against things, you can actually by through your actions, um, create positive, the ripple effect that goes out and, and affects things in a positive, positive way. Right, exactly. I mean, you should see how many of my neighbors have started growing food and mulching out their lawns and those sorts of things. At first they thought well, I was a little bit crazy, but then they see what's going on in my yard and they're, they're a lot of them are imitating it now. And that's happening all over the place as people start doing this, as it becomes a, a model, an example, and other people say, wow, that looks really nice. I want to do that. And then we, we all reduce our ecological footprint by doing that. Your book, um, Gaia's Garden, A Guide to Homescale Permaculture, is a very um, life-affirming, positive book. I felt great reading it and felt great um, through the whole thing. And I also looked at your website. And on your website, you have a lot of articles you've, that you've written. And one of them was on peak oil. And it sounds like, Toby, that you do not think that peak oil, which a lot of people um, that I've talked to on the show think that it kind of means the end of civilization, it sounds like you feel like it's not the end and you're not um, joining the ranks of the doomers. <laughs> could you could you explain to our listeners why you um, don't think peak oil means the end? Right. Well, it certainly means some big changes, just the, the fact that our society is so completely based on oil and we've used up at least half of the oil available, so we're starting to go on the downside of the curve. Uh, so there are obviously going to be some huge changes, but the... Societies, since I understand ecosystems pretty well, since I've spent so much time studying how really complex systems work, our society is incredibly complex. And when, when a system that complex suddenly gets fewer resources, it almost never just collapses and dies. Now, that's, that's the way I think a lot of people are looking at it, as though if we have less oil, our society is so based on oil, it's just going to collapse and die. But that... There's nothing in nature that tells you that is what happens. That when really complex systems face change like that, they adjust and they adapt. And there certainly are some disruptions while it goes on, but they, um, and, I'm, and I'm certainly not saying that life exactly as we know it with our mass consumption is going to continue, but I, I feel very strongly that, that a human being's hallmark trait is adaptability. And we're already beginning to adapt to a lot of the changes that we're seeing. There's certainly some political systems that are, that are in the way. But we're incredibly adaptable. <clears throat> and it's, it's my very strong belief that as we face these changes, we will begin making the types of adjustments that we need to, just as any complex system adapts to different different levels of resource availability. That's it's just it's the way nature works. So everything in nature tells me that this is not the end of the world, that we're certainly in for some big changes. But I'm I'm actually more excited about the future than I've been in years because I, I think the opportunities that are open to us are incredible. That yes, there are gonna be some rough spots, there's no doubt about it, but the opportunities that are out there are, are just amazing right now. Um, many, many years ago before you discovered permaculture, did you ever think that your life, that you would be living out in the country and then in the city teaching about um, the patterns of nature and how to live in harmony with nature? Has your life turned out how you wanted it to, would you say? It's, it's, it's turned out a lot better than I, than I wanted it to. I thought I was going to be kind of a bench scientist and that that would be interesting enough and I'd spend most of my life indoors doing research. And, and it, uh, it hasn't worked out that way. So no, I'm very excited about, about the way things have gone, just being able to use nature as my teacher and then try and pass that information along. It's been a, a really exciting adventure for me, and I'm just, just trying to be the best student of nature that I can be. That's, that's I think, my main task. Now, if, if listeners wanted to get a hold of you, or uh, do you have any upcoming classes or courses that you're teaching? Well, I'm, I'm teaching mostly locally these days. I'm trying to be fairly local. Um, teaching in Portland and teaching in Seattle. I also teach regularly down in L.A. with, with Larry Santoyo. Um, and I'm doing a few talks here and there. I'll be in Minneapolis in January. I'll be in Texas, outside of Austin in September. And I try to keep my website updated, and the website is patternliteracy.com, patternliteracy.com. Um, so that's where folks can find out 
where I'm going to be and, and uh, those sorts of things. But they're certainly welcome to contact me via the website. I get a lot of email, so I can't get back <laughs> as quickly as, I, as I'd like to, but, uh, but the, the website is certainly one way to find out what I'm up to. And Gaia's Garden, I think, is available in most major bookstores. Do you want to um, maybe tell, my, tell our listeners where they can get that book and um, anything you'd like to add about the book? Yeah, um, it is available at, at any, any bookstore, your local bookstore, independent bookstore is certainly one I'd recommend ordering it from just to support local businesses, although it's certainly carried at Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and those sorts of places. Um, so those are the main places to get it. And, uh, yeah, the new edition just out is all color, uh, full-color photographs, a bunch of design drawings in it, updated plant tables, a lot more information, and a new chapter on urban permaculture. So it's a lot more relevant to, uh, to city dwellers with very small or even with no yards um, than, than the first edition was. So I'm, I'm very pleased with it. It was a lot of fun to do the new edition. Well, thank you so much, Toby. It was great to talk to you today. Well, thank you, Jill, very much. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com. Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier. Music by Dana Lyons. Thanks for listening.